Hello, and welcome to Family Folktales from the Nashville Public Library. I'm Susan Polder, a librarian at the Main Library. Today's story is The Fairy Nurse, an Irish story from Andrew Lang's Lilac Fairy Book. There was once a little farmer and his wife living near Coolgarrow. They had three children, and my story happened while the youngest was a baby. The wife was a good wife enough, but her mind was all on her family and her farm, and she hardly ever went to her knees without falling asleep, and she thought the time spent in the chapel was twice as long as it need be. So, friends, she let her man and her two children go before her one day to Mass, while she called to consult a fairy man about a disorder one of her cows had. She was late at the chapel and was sorry all the day after, for her husband was in grief about it, and she was very fond of him. Late that night he was wakened up by the cries of his children calling out, Mother! Mother! When he sat up and rubbed his eyes, there was no wife by his side, and when he asked the little ones what was become of their mother, they said they saw the room full of nice little men and women, dressed in white and red and green, and their mother in the middle of them going out by the door, as if she was walking in her sleep. Out he ran and searched everywhere round the house, but neither tale nor tidings did he get of her for many a day. Well, the poor man was miserable enough, for he was as fond of his woman as she was of him. It used to bring the salt tears down his cheeks to see his poor children neglected and dirty, as they often were, and they'd be bad enough only for a kind neighbor that used to look in whenever she could spare time. The infant was away with a nurse. About six weeks later, just as he was going out to his work one morning, a neighbor that used to mind women when they were ill came up to him and kept step by step with him to the field, and this is what she told him. Just as I was falling asleep last night, I heard a horse's tramp on the grass and a knock at the door, and there, when I came out, was a fine-looking dark man mounted on a black horse, and he told me to get ready in all haste, for a lady was in great want of me. As soon as I put on my cloak and things, he took me by the hand, and I was sitting behind him before I felt myself stirring. "'Where are we going, sir?' says I. "'You'll soon know,' says he, and he drew his fingers across my eyes, and not a ray could I see. I kept a tight grip of him, and I little knew whether he was going backwards or forwards or how long we were about it, till my hand was taken again, and I felt the ground under me. The fingers went the other way across my eyes, and there we were before a castle door, and in we went through a big hall and great rooms all painted in fine green colors, with red and gold bands and ornaments, and the finest carpets and chairs and tables and window curtains, and grand ladies and gentlemen walking about. At last we came to a bedroom, with a beautiful lady in bed, with a fine bouncing boy beside her. The lady clapped her hands, and in came the dark man, and kissed her and the baby, and praised me, and gave me a bottle of green ointment to rub the child all over. Well, the child I rubbed, sure enough, but my right eye began to smart, and I put my finger up and gave it a rub, and then stared, for never in all my life was I so frightened. The beautiful room was a big, rough cave, with water oozing over the edges of the stones and through the clay. And the lady and the lord and the child wizened, poverty-bitten creatures, nothing but skin and bone and the rich dresses were old rags. I didn't let on that I found any difference, and after a bit, says the dark man, go before me to the hall door, and I will be with you in a few moments, and see you safe home. Well, just as I turned into the outside cave, who should I see watching near the door but poor Molly? She looked round all terrified, and says she to me in a whisper, I'm brought here to nurse the child of the king and queen of the fairies. "'but there is one chance of saving me. "'All the court will pass the cross near Temple Shambo next Friday night "'on a visit to the fairies of Old Ross. 
If John can catch me by the hand or cloak when I ride by, and has courage not to let go his grip, I'll be safe. Here's the king. Don't open your mouth to answer. I saw what happened with the ointment. The dark man didn't once cast his eyes toward Molly, and he seemed to have no suspicion of me. When we came out, I looked about me, and, and where do you think we were but in the deck of the Wrath of Cromog? I was on the horse again, which was nothing but a big ragweed, till I was in dread every minute I'd fall off. But nothing happened till I found myself in my own cabin. The king slipped five guineas into my hand as soon as I was on the ground, and thanked me and bade me good night. I hope I'll never see his face again. I got into bed and couldn't sleep for a long time, and when I examined my five guineas in the morning, that I left in the table drawer the last thing, I found five withered leaves of oak. Bad luck to the giver. Well, you may all think the fright and the joy and the grief the poor man was in when the woman finished her story. They talked and talked, but we needn't mind what they said till Friday night came, when both were standing where the mountain road crosses the one going to Ross. There they stood, looking towards the bridge of Thor, in the dead of night, with a little moonlight shining from over Kilachdarmid. At last she gave a start, and, "'By this and by that,' she, says she, "'here they come, bridles jingling and feathers tossing.' He looked but could see nothing, and she stood trembling and her eyes wide open, looking down the way to the ford of Balanacula. I see your wife, says she, riding on the outside, just so as to rub against us. We'll walk on quietly, as if we suspected nothing, and when we are passing I'll give you a shove. If you don't do your duty, then, woe be with you. Well, they walked on easy, and the poor hearts beating in both their breasts. And though he could see nothing, he heard a faint jingle and trampling and rustling. And at last he got the push that she promised. He spread out his arms, and there was his wife's waist within them, and he could see her plain. But such a hullabaloo arose, as if there was an earthquake, and he found himself surrounded by horrible-looking things, roaring at him and striving to pull his wife away. But he made the sign of the cross, and bid them be gone in God's name, and held his wife as if it was iron his arms were made of. Bedad, in one moment everything went as silent as the grave, and the poor woman lying in a faint in the arms of her husband and her good neighbor. Well, all in good time she was minding her family and her business again. And I'll go bail after the fright she got. She spent more time on her knees and avoided ferrymen all the days of the week, and particularly on Sunday. It is hard to have anything to do with the good people without getting a mark from them. My brave nurse didn't escape no more than another. She was one Thursday at the market of Enniscorthy, when what did she see walking among the tubs of butter but the dark man— very hungry-looking, and taking a scoop out of one tub and out of another. "'Oh, sir,' says she, very foolish, "'I hope your lady is well and the baby.' "'Pretty well, thank you,' says he, rather frightened-like. "'How do I look in this new suit?' says he, getting to one side of her. "'I can't see a plane at all, sir,' says she. "'Well, now,' says he, getting round her back to the other side, Musha, indeed, sir, your coat looks no better than a withered dock leaf. Maybe then, says he, it will be different now. And he struck the eye next to him with a switch. Friends, she never saw a glimmer after with that one till the day of her death. That was the fairy nurse from Andrew Lang's Lilac Fairy Book. Special thanks to Ginger Sands for our theme music, you can find more of Ginger's music at iTunes or on her website at www.gingersands.com. And if you'd like to comment on today's story, send me an email. I can be reached at susan.polter, that's P-O-U-L-T-E-R, at nashville.gov. Thanks for listening.